The following program was paid for by the friends and partners of Neil Thomas Ministries. John chapter 8, verse 31 to 32, I'm reading. And then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Powerful statement by Jesus, and this is really, I guess, the theme of my my message is these words from Christ. If you abide in my word, you're my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The word abide, Jesus uses it quite a bit about abiding in him and him abiding in us. And the word abide there in the Greek means to remain, to stay, to wait for. We often think of it as living or sitting. But if you abide in something, it actually indicated that word, that, that meaning of remaining. It's got a consistency to it. Abide in God's word. Abide in the word of the Lord is I'm going to stay there. I'm going to hold on to it. I'm going to stay there. If you live somewhere, you stay there regardless of what else is around or other opportunities. This is the place I've chosen to live. So until you announce you're not living there, I guess that's where we expect to find you. And if we're looking for you, we go to where you live, where you abide, your abode, your home where you're going to remain. We expect to find that that's where you're going to stay. If you're going to stay in a job, if you're going to abide in a job, if you're going to abide in a town or in a house or in an address, that's, that's now your place now. We'll call it your place of residence. And Jesus is saying to us to make his word our residence, to reside there and to remain there and to stay there. And it has this waiting in it too. You abide there because you wait there. That's where you wait for things to come. That's where you wait for the next day to start is in that place where you live and where you abide. And Jesus tells us we need to abide in his word. We need to know his word to be able to abide in it. But being a Christian is abiding in the word of Jesus. It's not just getting excited about what he's done or be moved by his sacrifice, but it's abiding in his word and living in his word. And the word he refers to there is logos. And we've had a bit of teaching of late uh, about logos and rima, the general word of God and the specific word of God. And Jesus is telling us here, abide in my words. In other words, abide in my teachings. The word there for word, logos in Greek, can mean my essays or my explanations, my teachings, my beliefs, what I've taught you, the things that I've said to everyone. Take hold of those words and abide in them. And so what Jesus has to say to us on so many things in life, we need to take hold of that and that needs to be where we live. If we abide in those things, that's truly who his disciple is. It's the person who abides in his word and lives in his word and holds on to his word. And then you shall know the truth. The word know here means you'll perceive, you'll recognize, you'll understand. You won't just know about it, huh? You'll know it. To, to know the word, to know the truth of God, you've got to live in it and abide in it. Not just hear it once. Hearing it once isn't going uh, to make a big change, yeah? isn't going to turn around the ship. Is Just people preaching one message on something isn't going to cause a people or a, a church to suddenly uh, understand fully. You've got to live in it to understand it. And if you live in it, then you'll come to know it. You'll perceive it. You'll recognize it. You'll know it so well that you'll, you'll see where it needs to be applied. You'll recognize the truth when it's given to you. And you'll recognize when it's not given to you. You'll know it by what you see. You'll know what it isn't. And when it isn't the truth, you'll recognize that's not the truth because you know how to recognize it because you live in it and you know it in this way. You understand it. You perceive it. You'll understand you'll know what? Well, he says the the truth, the truth that you'll set you free. What's the truth that will set you free? Well, the word here can mean divine truth, reality, the opposite of illusion. You'll know the truth. You'll know how things really are. You'll see the reality of the situation. Not just how you want to feel or what makes you feel good, but the reality of the situation, the real truth. And knowing that reality that comes from knowing, understanding the Word of God, that comes from a living in the Word of God. So if you live in the Word of God, you'll know it. And what you'll know of that Word is the truth. And knowing that truth will set you free. And what's the word freedom here mean? It means liberate release you from bondage. Friends, if we know Jesus and we know God, we should be released from bondage. We should be set free, set free of whatever comes against us, whatever would try to bind us, we can be set free. And in, that means in every area of our life. And I take it and I look over my own life and the times when I haven't 
abided in his word in some area of my life, that's when I've come unstuck. That's when I've gotten bound. That's when I've had trouble. And when I've come back and, and started to live in what he says in that situation, then I've been able to get unleashed and unlocked and loosened from the thing that was binding me. Often the, the disappointment, the hurt, the rejection of that situation, when I will live it and address it and abide in God's word in the way I handle it. Then I'm able to be freed from it binding me. The truth will set you free. What a wonderful thing. You shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. It will make you free. It will put you in a free place. The truth of, of Jesus Christ. Now, just saying that or singing about that once, we've got to know it. We've got to know it and then we've got to choose to live in it and abide in it. If we'll take hold of God's word and we'll live in it, we'll stay there and we'll remain in it and be willing to wait for it, it'll set us free. Live in it, be willing to wait for it and say, no matter what, I'm going to hold on to what it says. I'm going to live by what it says. I'm going to apply what it says. This is where I live. And, and circumstances might come and say, why don't you come and move over here? Why don't you come and, and apply this instead? Why don't you give up on holding on to that? Why do you still live in that place? Why do you still? Because there's a promise that, if I, that I'm going to gain by staying here. There's a word that's going to become a reality by me staying here. I'm going to live in what God said. I'm going to live in what God said. And, you know, that can go both for what he says, Logos general, and to what he says to us specifically, yes, personally in our lives. We need to hold on to it and be willing to wait for it and to be determined to remain in it. Remain in it. You know what? We live in a day and age where remaining in anything is not so popular. It's not so good. We're looking for change. We're looking, and if we don't get a quick result, we're looking for something else. We're going to move on to something else. We want now and we want it quickly. Jesus actually says you need to be willing to remain. You need to be willing to abide. You need to be willing to hold on to what my word says, to the promise from my word, to, the, to, to what I have taught you. You know, this is true for every area of our life, that we need to abide, remain, stay in God's word. And, and you know what? This word, even Jesus himself, the red letter words of Jesus, have things to say on so many areas of our life. God's word on money and finance. Jesus talks about it. The scriptures talk about it. God's word talks about it. And if you want God's way in it, if you want the blessing of God on that area of your life, you need to hear God's word on it and remain in God's word on it. Tim challenged us about it this morning, the whole concept of giving and the importance of giving and the blessing of giving and the importance it is to us as a society and then to us as individuals. Tim talked about the blessing of society the blessing it is to our society, also to us as individuals. The, the teaching that what you sow, you'll reap. When you put out, it comes back to you. When you help others in their need, need uh, help will be able to come to you in your time of need or maybe to your children or your family because of the kindness, the generosity that you have sown to others. That's so important. It's all there clearly in the word of God. When we see it, when you abide in the word that God speaks about money, giving is actually not a problem. It's something you look to do. You're, you're concerned not to do. Just as some are concerned about not saving, they're freaking out when there's not being money saved every week. When you know God's word on giving, you're freaking out when you're not giving because you know that's actually your savings. That's your future. That's the best investment. The best thing I can do with this resource that's come to me this week is give it away. Give some of it away. How much should I give away? What's, what, what should I keep? What should I give? It becomes a question you want to ask yourself because it's so important to you, not a question you want to avoid. Because it's so important to you to save or to worry about the, the principles according to the word, the world. Jesus said you can't serve God and mammon. Mammon, the spirit over money. You can't listen to what God says on it and what mammon says on it. He gave some pretty radical teachings. If you get a chance, have a look at Luke 16. It's quite a radical chapter. Not heard very many sermons from it. Where Jesus really challenges our whole thinking about money and its power. And says, if you're not faithful in how you handle money, then you're not going to be able to be faithful in, in other things. And then he's talking about handling money according to God's word. We are so got ingrained in us. There's so much said to us about mammon, and it's become so important to us. It, it, it's the strongest voice in our life in this society. I go to societies that live in villages, and what family says is so important. The word of family, the requirement of family is over everything, including their money and their resources. That's not nowhere near as important as what family says 
and bowing down to family and submitting to family. That's why when a father abuses an uncle, abuses a, do- a, a, a niece, nothing's done because family's more important. Family's more important. And, that, and those societies where family's more important so much, it lies so much truth, so much bondage, truth is hidden, so much bondage takes place because they're following another word and not the word of God. Well, I'll tell you, the same thing happens with money too. In the end, bondage takes place. It ends up being a bondage. Even the wealthy man is under bondage to the fear of the money and watching his money and managing his money and the things he says he can or cannot do based on what money says. It's the bondage of our society. Jesus said, you can't follow my word and the word of mammon. He said, you can't follow my word and those of you that follow the word of family over my word. You won't be able to follow it. It's got a lot to say on family. The, the, Jesus, the word of God, has things to say on husband, wife, marriage, children and discipline. What the word says about that, he says, abide in it. I can tell you, if you'll abide in it, if you'll hold on to it, then you will see God's blessings. I say to young couples getting married, people with young children, abide the, by the word of God over your children. Deal with your children according to the word of God. Make sure that latest book you've read is according to the word of God. That it's coming from the scripture. That it's not coming from the latest of psychology. If the latest of psychology is in disagreement with the scripture, put it aside. You need to put it aside. You need to abide in what the scripture says about raising children. About how do husbands and wives should relate to one another. Go by what the scripture says. Believe me, if you will hold on to that, you will have a good relationship. You will have a a strong marriage if you hold on to that. And you keep that in place. And you don't just say, well, there's some things there I just can't really do or they're really hard or they don't fit in with my culture, they don't fit in with my situation. You know, God understands. God hasn't given us these words to live by as some sort of you're not good enough if you don't. Therefore, our benefit. They're not for our punishment. They're not the, the, God's advice on marriage, God's advice on raising children, God's advice on handing money, God's advice on bosses and employees hasn't been given to us. And we say, well, you know, I've sort of had to make a deal with God. You know, he, he's forgiven me for not following what he said. This is not about breaking, sinning before God and breaking some rule. This is about the best road for you. God's not going to punish anybody for not keeping his words on any of these areas, or Jesus isn't going to punish anyone for not keeping his words. He's saying, I want to set you free, and the way for you to be free is to keep my words. So often we look at the words of God as something we've got to negotiate or something that is is put on us as some sort of restriction, and then we can't get the whole thing, don't judge me, and God understands when I can't keep his word. Of course he understands. He understands the struggle of us keeping his word. Jesus is telling us that there's something we really need to commit to do here. There's a decision that we need to make to remain in his words so the truth of those words you can know and that truth will set you free. It will keep you from being caught up in bondage. This might sound arrogant, but if you want to sit in front of me and you want to tell me about some Christian who never got the blessing or promises of God, something happened in their marriage that's not according to the promises of God, something happened in their family that's not according to the promise of God, give me time and I'll tell you where they didn't keep his word. Because if they'd kept his word, that should not have happened. I believe that with all my heart. Because I know when things have gone wrong in my own life, I can point to where I haven't kept his word. So I'm not saying this, hey, I'm sitting up here, it's never happened to me. It's happened to me, that's why I'm telling you about it. When you hold his word, it says here, if you keep my words, if you abide in my words, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. If something's come up and bound you and robbed from you, there's some word you've left out. need to recognize that. If it's an attack of the devil, well, then there's going to be a victory on the other side. If it's Satan trying to keep a promise from God for you, well, that promise is coming. You just remain, you hang on, and it's coming. You know I'm keeping God's words. And people are saying, well, what's going on? They they accuse Job of having done something wrong. He said, I've done nothing wrong. I've kept God's words. Why this is happening, I don't know. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away, but I I haven't put aside his words. And, of course, we saw the blessing that came to him. He got double of everything that he lost. There was a lesson in there for him. There was a lesson in there for others. There was a lesson in there for us. Not a book very popular to read, but it's in the Bible for a reason. Read Job. Read the discussions between Job and God. And God said, Job has not done anything against me. But the men who incorrectly judged Job, God said, you are the men who are an offence to me. 
because you ran around telling him that he hadn't kept my word. You misjudged him. You misaccused him. You misused my word over him. Now we need to know his word. We need to live in his word. We need to remain in his word and then we can experience God's blessing in our life. There's, there's words in here on how to deal with a boss. If you are a boss, there's words there on how to deal with your employees. Treat them like Jesus is working for you. If you're working for someone, it says work for the boss as if he's Jesus. There's very clear words in here on forgiveness. And they're really unbendable and they're really quite scary. They're really quite challenging. It talks about people that have experienced the forgiveness of God but don't go and pass that forgiveness to others. It's a very strong word. We need to stay in it. We need to be afraid. When a Christian tells me I can't forgive, it scares me. I think, oh my goodness, how can you say that? Do you know the word of God? I've known unforgiveness, I've known hurt, and it bothers me and I chase after it in me until I get it out of me. I don't want it in me. The Bible tells me not to go to bed with it in me. Don't go to sleep in that condition. And I'm blown away by Christians that happily hold on to that unforgiveness and they'll find everyone will have a coffee they can talk to about. I think, let this thing go. It's going to rob from you. It's going to destroy you. But I have a right to hold on to this. Well, of course you do. Give up your right. God understands. Of course he understands. It's what you're losing. No one's after you. God's not after you. You're missing out. You're, working, you're walking in the wrong word. You're abiding in a word that will steal from you. You are sowing something that from which you will reap corruption. The Bible warns me of that. My father tells me that. My dad used to give us advice on how to live our lives. My mother, on, on how to conduct ourselves, about washing, about cleansing, about how to, you know, we, you know, you teach a little kid how to wipe their bottom, yes? And how they need to do it thoroughly. If they don't do it thoroughly and they leave the dags hanging around, they're going to be itchy and sore and they're going to get worms and all this stuff. We have to teach them how to do it right, yeah? But we're like saying to God, oh, oh, look, you know, you, you understand, I can't do it right. The reason he's giving us that word is so we have clean bums, if you know what I mean. That's why he's giving us that word, so our lives are clean of the things that will hurt us. What sort of person would punish or beat up their kid because he doesn't clean his bum right? Well, maybe you would do it so finally he does for his own good. But you don't want to turn it into that. You want to teach him the need to. So when they're walking around at two and a half and three and saying, so well, that's what I told you. You're in such a hurry to get back outside. You're in out there with those dags on there and now you're, now you're all sore. Well, that's what we're talking about here again. You don't punish a kid for that. You don't judge him. You don't think he's bad. You just know he's ignoring your word on it, yes? He's not practicing it and he's not living in it when it comes to toilet time. He's not living in it when it comes to shower time. They're ignoring your word on eating and then they wonder why at 17 they forever get the flu and the cold because they don't eat right. They don't sleep enough. Say, so if you get sleep, you won't have a cold once a month. But they don't ignore that word. We don't punish them for it. We want them to hear what we have to say, live in it and remain in it, enjoy the blessings of it and keep the curses of it away, which is always being tired and having headaches and getting colds all the time. Well, that's what this is like. It's words to us how to live by. It's words to live by so that we'll know the truth and we'll be set free and we won't be bound. Because the devil wants to bind us through our marriage. You know, the beautiful marriage you have, he wants to use it to hurt you. The children you have, he hopes he can use it to destroy you to bring conflict to your life. And if you don't follow God's word in your, in your marriage, it probably will be bringing the very things you don't want it to bring you. We live in a society now that's put this word aside and they're going on about the ice problem and the suicide problem. Now we've got home invasion problem, yeah? Now we're all not even safe in our homes. You don't want to look at the news because every night there seems to be somebody who was watching TV who got attacked in their house by a bunch of marauding boys. We're going to end up like other nations. We're all going to have bars on our windows. We'll end up with security. We'll end up with gated communities. Why is it going this way? Because our society has put this aside and its principles aside. More and more and more. And the more it does, the more trouble we'll have. But I can't, do, I can't make a decision for the whole of society today, but I can make a decision for me. And then I can encourage others and influence our society that way, yes? That I'm going to live in the word of God and abide in his word. It says things on loving each other, on anger. It says very clear words in here on resolving disagreements. There's clear words in here on pornography. You know, Jesus talks about pornography. 
I can give you the scriptures. He talks about enemies and how to deal with them. We need to look at his words and hear what he says. And he doesn't say it. And, and those words are taken. I've been, I was in youth groups and they took some of those teaching on pornography and had us all at the altar repenting and begging God not to throw us in hell. The words weren't put in there to warn you that you're going to go to hell for looking at pornography. It's there to warn you what it's going to do to you. What it's going to do to you. What it's going to do to you. Not what God's going to do to you. God know, understands the frailty of men. He, understand, he understands the sex drive. He understands all of that. But he says, the truth will set you free. The truth, the reality of it. You'll see the reality of it and you won't settle with it anymore. We all know the reality of what happens when you stand in the middle of the road. Middle of the road. We all know the reality of the things that will hurt us. And when, when, because of those things, we don't go near them. The word of God wants to show us the reality of not choosing God's way. So we will choose God's ways because of the, the truth of it. Because how it's best for us. And how we want to hold on to it. Our, young, our children need to hear this truth. They need, to, they need to hear it and then they need to make the decision to live in it. You don't get to make that decision for somebody, but they certainly need to hear it. They certainly need to value it. That's why I, 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 I want to read out those words at every dedication for Isabel last week. She needs to have the word of God in front of her. It needs to be on the front of her parents' forehead. She needs to look at her dad and see the word of God. She needs to look at him and think he lives by God's word. He won't like this. If my children said, I didn't want to tell you this because I knew you wouldn't like it because it's not according to God's way, I think, good. At least they believe I hold up God's way and I won't budge from it. That's what you need to be, parents. Don't budge from it. That's what, you sh that's what your parents should be, teenagers. They shouldn't budge from it. And if that annoys you, well, be annoyed because they're, they're giving you the best example, not to budge from what God says and what his word says. Because outside of his word, if that becomes an acceptable way to live, you're going to get hurt. Please, I so hope you don't hear, God's not happy with me when I don't live according to his word. Only like a father or mother who are unhappy with a child who not listening to their word is going to suffer as a result. Suffer as a result. You can't afford to get offended when your children don't follow your word. They're human. They're struggling. That's not, that's not the problem. It's the consequences of them not following. That's what God's concerned about. The consequences of us not following his word and keeping his word. King David was, was told by God that he was going to be king of Israel. He was anointed as king of Israel when he was a young teenager. He never got to be that king for something like 25 years after he was anointed. And the last seven years of that, he lived in caves and he was running around and the king, the king of the time was trying to take his life. And, and David um, started making alliances and he became this little group and the Philistines, the enemies of Israel, gave him a little city to live in or one of the kings of the Philistines gave him a city to live in. And he went off and he was, took all the men out to go and get involved in something, a, a war that never happened. And by the t when they came back to the city, their city had been attacked and marauded by the Amalekites and all their wives and children had been taken away and all their goods had been taken away and their city had been basically burnt to the ground and the men got very angry with him and said we've followed you we've been faithful to you you say you're this king where's God how come this happened we did what you said even his men started because they, look, they looked at the end the death of all their wives and children had been taken away and how were they going to get them back and David went to the Lord and the Lord said, he said, if I chase after them, will I get them? And he said, chase after them and you'll get everyone back. So he went after the Amalekites and in the end he defeated them and he got back every wife, every child and every cattle, everything that was stolen, plus other things that these Amalekite marauders had stolen from other people. So he ended up coming back to his hometown with more than he had in the beginning and every life, not one life was lost as a result. But that's pretty hard times. And he wrote Psalms at this time. So it's a very difficult times. You know, three days later, three days after that event, which probably was one of the hardest in his life because he had his wives, his children had all been taken from him. He becomes king. King Saul dies just three days later. At a time, it's been 25 years since I'm going to be king. I'm now a grown man. I was told this at 12. I'm something like 37 years old. It doesn't look like it's ever going to happen. 
I'm living in, I've been hiding in caves. Now I'm, now I'm a vagabond living in a town with all my men. Now we're getting attacked in our own town and our wives are being taken from us. You know, when, when's this going to end? How, how, you know, I'm supposed to be the king of Israel and anything, I'm the vagabond. I'm the gypsy. And I live in danger, constant danger. But three days later, God just suddenly turned that around. You know, David remained in what God said to him. David remained in his word. He remained faithful to God. He remained a righteous man. In that story uh, about the attack on the people, there's an example of David's justice and the way he treats men equally. There's a little story there about his, his nature and his, just the justice of the man, the righteousness of the man. You know, he remained like that before God. He held on to that word and that word came to pass 25 years later. He remained in it. You read that story in 1 Samuel, end of 1 Samuel and the beginning of 2 Samuel. John chapter 15, verse 7. It says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. You know, I really believe that. I believe that. If you walk in your marriage as the word of God says, if you love your wife like Christ loved the church, if you submit to Jesus as we submit to him, and that's a, a, a willing receiving, yes, letting him lead us. If you, if you submit to your husband as, you, as we receive Christ, and if men love their wives as Christ loved us, whoa, as he served us, as he loved us, then in your marriage, what you ask for, you'll receive. Because you'll ask from a place in the word of God, abiding in his words. If you raise your children according to the word of God, and you're faithful in that, what you ask for your children, you'll receive. If you handle your finances according to the word of God, what you ask, you'll receive. That's the promise there. If you abide in me and my words live in you, remain in you, stay in you, hang on in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. That's a wonderful promise from God. In our ministry, in every part of our life, if we will abide in his word, then what we ask, we will receive. We know we're all remaining in some word. In the way you live your life, the way you conduct, you're doing it according to some word. You'd like to think it's your own, but I suggest to you, we're just all sponges. You've heard it from someone else. You might be doing things trying to be opposite to what you didn't like in your own family. You're, you're living according to some word. You conduct yourself according to some word, according to some set of values. I'm telling you today, we need to abide in Jesus' words. They're the words that we need to live in. And sometimes to abide in God's word, we need to be willing to leave the other word. And that's the biggest problem, yes? We come to Christ and we want him to save our soul and we want him to touch us and we love what he does for us. We love his saving of us and we love what he did on the cross and we want him to come and, and just bless us and we want our prayers answered and we want to all stand around and agree until it comes through. But you know what? You need to abide in his word for it to come through. You need to be living in his word for it to come through. Because otherwise you're sowing other things that are in complete opposite to what you're asking for. We need to be living in his word. That's where the victory is. We can have the victory. All we've got to choose to do is live in this word. Because the victory is in doing what he says, living by what he says, remaining in what he says. And to abide in God's word, you know what? You might have to be willing to leave the other word. And sometimes we say, I want what Jesus says about family. I want what Jesus says about relationships. I want God's blessing, but I don't want to leave behind the, the things I'm doing and saying and the rights that I'm hanging on to and how I want it to be. I want him to come and bless my family, but I'm not about to let my husband lead. I want him to bless my family, but I'm not about to love my wife like Christ loved the church. I want him to bless my future, but I'm not about to obey my parents or give them honour. But I want God to bless my future. I want God to be a part of what I'm doing. I want him to bless my resources, but I'm not about to hear the message, particularly I heard from Tim this morning. Matthew 10, says some strong words of Jesus, but if you think of them in light of what Jesus is offering us, Matthew 10 verse 37 says, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. 
He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. You know, laying hold of the word of God often means we need to lose, let go of some other word. We, to take on the life of that word, we need to let go of the life of the other word. In fact, every time it will. To start applying Jesus' words in your family means something's going to change. In your relationship, in your finance, in your work situation as a boss, as an employer, as an employee of somebody, in your relationships in, with forgiveness, you're going to have to let go of something. And that's why Jesus speaks like this so often, because he knew for these disciples to take up his words, they were going to have to let go. They were going to have to let go. And his words would have to come over the words of family and over the, and, and the words of the, what we're told a family should do or should be. We're going to hear, no, what does Jesus tell us a family should do or should be? What do his words say? That's why Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. There's going to be a cross involved in this in stepping out and, and taking hold of his words. We, fear, we so fear your failure so, up, so much that we don't want to let go of those words. We're, we're so afraid that if I let go of those words on money, if I let go of, if I go of my position, if I become a more loving a, a husband like Jesus, if I become a wife according to the book of Ephesians, if I become like this, I'm going to lose. I'm going to lose Everything within me is telling me I'm going to lose. The words that I've heard and followed all my life say I'm going to lose. It looks to me like losing. And that's why Jesus said you've got to be willing to lose. You've got to be really willing to feel like you're losing or let go you're losing. God doesn't see you as losing, but you might feel like you're losing. You might feel like you're having to let go. Well, it's going to take letting go to apply these words of Jesus. In Genesis chapter 12, we read, Abraham getting told about God's promises to him, which were promises that would affect all of us, actually. And it's just verse 1 to 3 of Genesis chapter 12. Verse 1 to 3 of Genesis 12 says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. And make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Wow. What a, what a promise from God. What a blessing from, what a promise from God. What a blessing to come your way. I'm going to make your name great. You, you will be a blessing to all the families of the earth. Who blesses you, I will bless, and who curses you will be cursed. Who comes against you is going to have me to deal with, and who blesses you will be rewarded by me. That's what the Lord says to Abram. You know, these are the same sort of promises that we have in Christ today. This is who we are in Christ. God's made promises to you to bless you, to make you his child, to make you great, to use you, to equip you for everything he designed for you to be. He's promised us great blessings and places that go on to, into eternity. He's promised us the opportunity to share his throne with him and share his glory with him. Wonderful promises we have from God. But what did Abraham have to do to lay hold of that promises? He had to get out of where he was. His father and family were idol worshippers. The country that he lived in did not believe in this God. He had to get out of there. The words and the practices, the sacrifices and stuff that were going on in that land were not of God. And Abram had to get out of there. His household, he had to get out of his father's household. He had to make a decision to no longer follow the ways of his family anymore and listen to what they had to say. Sometimes that's what we have to do if the, the, the words of that house are con continually opposite to the words of God. We've got to step out of that situation. To, put, to abide in God's word and apply his word in our life. That, sounds, that can be hard. That definitely is challenging. And you don't want to do it unless you believe what I'm going to say to you and that the word of God is your hope and is your anchor and is your future. Getting a young person to make any of this sort of a step and not believe it is, is crazy. They've got to believe it. They've got to step out because they've got to actually see, I want God's word and I can't have it here. I need to abide in his word and I'm not abiding in it here. I'm not abiding in it when I do this. I'm not abiding in it when I spend my money this way. I'm not abiding in it when I speak to my wife this way. I'm not abiding in it when I refuse to submit to my husband in this way. 
I'm not abiding it when I don't bite my tongue. I'm not abiding it when I get angry. I'm not abiding in it when I dishonor my parents. I'm not abiding in it when I look at this stuff. I'm not abiding in it when I hang out with these complete non-believers and mockers. I'm not abiding in it. I need to step away from it. But, you know, you've got to see that for yourself. I can go around here and tell everybody what I think they should step away from and what word they should abide in. But now we're back to Old Testament. Here's a list of rules and here's what you've got to do. And then you feel like this is what I have to do for God to be pleased with me. Please don't hear this message that this has anything to do with God being pleased with you. You keeping his words isn't going to make God pleased with you. God's pleased with you because of Jesus Christ. We heard it this morning in the communion. Our value is in the cross, not in our keeping the words of Jesus. There are laws in this land that follow God's words and people enjoy the benefits of it. Our, our nation's rules and laws, the Western society, the Westminster system had so much on it based from the word of God and we've enjoyed the benefits of it. We're seeing as it's more and more put aside, our societies are decaying and everybody's angry and they're voting against the politicians. They're voting, they're, they're voting no when everyone said they should vote yes. There's these divisions happening in our society. It's breaking down because of that word of God being put aside. But, but keeping or trying to live by this word isn't what you do to get yourself right with God or please with God. Please don't hear that this morning. That's all done by Christ and his work. And he makes us God's child and he makes us acceptable to God. But there's no doubt that Jesus did say to his disciples that if you will live in this word and you'll abide in this word, and you'll hold on to this word and you'll remain in this word even no matter what's going on. You'll, you'll stand in this word. The truth will set you free. Abraham stood in that word. Abraham stood in that word for, tw for 20 years when th that there'd be a baby and there was no baby. He just stood in that word. He just hung on to that personal word for him. And the word for the world that said every family will be blessed in you. Abraham held on to that word. He remained in it. And he eventually saw the result of it. You know, we're attracted to the, the words of comfort and hope and peace that come from Jesus, and they're beautiful words. There are words of comfort and hope and peace, and he does bring comfort and he does bring hope and he does bring peace. You know, when he comes in and he touches our life with that, really in the hope that in experiencing that, we'll then turn around and say, okay, I need to apply you now to every area of my life. You're the word become flesh, and I need to apply you to every word of my life. It's very easier, easy when you're promoting the gospel to promote the words of comfort and peace. And say, Jesus come to bring you peace. Jesus come to set you free. Jesus come to unlock and take you out of your prisons. But you know how to get out of that prison and stay out of that prison? Live according to his word and abide in it. I see it in, in Bible college. I see young men and women come into college and they start to take the word and they live in it and then they kind of get so far and then now to... to what they've got to let go of to lay hold of the next thing, it becomes a little too hard. And then after a while, they don't even enjoy sitting under the word of God anymore because they just feel like it's condemning them because it's, it's shone the light on some stuff that they've said, I don't want to do this. I can't do this. I'm not going to claim this word. I don't want to follow this word. In the end, the choice is ours and the consequences will be ours. We talk about the word of God as food for our soul. We talk about the word of God. We did... At our dinner on Friday night is light, a light that shines in the dark. When we're scared, it shows us. It's also a light that will come in and show up the things we're hiding as well. It'll come in and it'll show up the stuff in the dark that we don't, that we don't want it to shine there. We don't want the word of God to shine there. That's when we don't want to be around it. We don't want to hear it. But the Bible also tells us that it's a sword. The same word that feeds us. The same word that's a light unto my feet and a lamp unto my path, which you know, in a lot of ways sounds very romantic and very nice. That same word is a sword that pierces to the division of soul and spirit. It cuts deep and it divides between your soul and your spirit, which is quite an interesting concept. The, the, the invisible you is the soul. That, that means wind, but character, personality, individuality, and the spirit, which is the spirit of God, life, breath, the source of life. And it goes in there and it really shows the difference between God's spirit and what's going on in your character. How your character lines up with this new spirit that's come to live inside of you. That word of God is a sword that speaks right there, deep in there. It's almost like a sword with a little light on the end of it. It pierces deep into the division of soul and spirit. And we need that sword in our life. And we need to hold on and we need to say, I'm going to hang in. This is hurting, but I'm going to hang on to this. I'm going to hold on to this word. I'm going to stay in this word. 
because we do really want the blessings of that word in our life, the blessings of that word in our marriage. You know what Jesus gave us the word for? Not, by, not to judge us by, but to set us free. And that's what I want, the point I want to make this morning. Jesus said, if you abide in my words, you are my disciples and God will be pleased with you. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples and I'll give you a reward for keeping my word in heaven. He didn't say that, did he? If you, are my, if you keep my word and my words abide in you, then you've met all my requirements. You're those that are now satisfied that God is happy with. It was not about that. It's not about God being pleased with you. It's not about the right for you to have a relationship with God. That's all done by Jesus. That is the wonder of the gospel. That is the amazing thing about which we sang about this morning. But God's given us his word and asked us to live in it and remain in it and hold on to it so we will experience the freedom, the true freedom that we sing about. The freedom that we sing about isn't just in singing about it. The freedom that we sing about isn't just something that drops on us. It's actually real freedom. And some, many people have been Christian a long time, still live bound by things. Disappointment, what's been done to you? He even wants to set you free from what other people have done. You feel you're still bound by people letting you down? He wants to set you free from that. You're still hurt by what someone's done? He wants to set you free from that. He wants you to walk free of that. And in his word, you can walk free of that. If you will hold on to his word. And as I said earlier, I've found my, times in my life I've been bound by things when I don't walk in his word on that matter. But when I walk in his word on that matter, I'm free and I'm actually able to pray and my prayers are answered. When I walk in his word in that area of my life. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask what you want and it will be done for you. If you abide in my words, if my words abide in you, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's a great promise from the Lord for us today. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just bless you and we thank you, Lord, for the power of your word. We thank you, Jesus, that we have your words in our hand. We have your words in our heart. Lord, I think of that verse in Hebrews where you said that you came to bring a new contract and it isn't about men turning to one another and saying, know the Lord, this is what you have to do to follow the Lord. But Lord, you want to write your word in our hearts and on our minds. And then Lord, you ask us to live in it, remain in it and hold on to it. And I thank you, Lord, you have word to write on the life of every man and woman here. Lord, we have your Logos word. We have what you said, Jesus. There's no doubt about the truth of what we're reading, how it's been preserved and brought down to us. There's no doubt about its power, Lord, it's the best-selling book in the world because, Lord, you want that word in people's hearts and lives. It outsells every book every year, Lord, and the world doesn't acknowledge it. The New York bestseller is not what somebody wrote. The Bible's the bestseller every year, and the New York Times don't want to acknowledge it because it'll just be the same prize every year to the same book. Lord, that's your word. That's your written word in our hand. And I acknowledge that this morning. Lord, you deserve the award every year for your word because your word is the best word every year that goes out. And there's nothing being written that deserves an award above this book, Lord, and its words to us, Lord God. I thank you, Lord, that you care about everyone in this room, that you've written these words, and you want to come into their lives and write your word on their hearts and minds. And if they'll hold on to that word, Lord, they'll know truth and they will be free. And they'll enjoy true freedom in every area of their life. I bless you and I thank you for that promise, Lord. Help us to hear this and understand it. And Lord, bless our afternoon as we return here tonight, Lord, to hear your word. And those invited to come, God, bring them in. We give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Thank you for listening. If you have been blessed by this message, please visit our website, neilthomasministries.com and click on the donate button.